So, he's still not around? Nope. He still doesn't play Final Fantasy, I take it? Nope. So, wanna talk about the Eorzean Symphony? Do I? Did I hear Eorzea? How'd you, you get, get here? here? Welcome to the Music Arcade! Hello everyone, I'm Galen the Sound Guy Firestone. Welcome to the Music Arcade. I'm Wanna Cut and we've really gotta change the locks. We really do. And I would like to welcome our special guest. Uh my name is Sam Zerol, aka the constant uh, Final Fantasy person that continues to stay in their four hordes. <laughs> uh yep, we have You're right, Final Fantasy is my favorite anime slash card game. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, I will fully admit that this episode is slightly last minute. This was meant to be a now playing topic, but Eddie, unfortunately, is still sick and is dealing with some stuff, so he could not join us. So we figured we'd bump it up to main topic, and we are going to talk about the very recent, uh, Eorzean Symphony concert, uh, performed in Las Vegas, Nevada, which I was lucky enough to be able to catch. It was not, to be clear, the FanFest concert. No. But it was a concert that happened around the time at FanFest, in the same city as FanFest, but wasn't directly related to FanFest. No, it was it technically allowed... separate but supplemental. It allowed Soken Yoshi P to stay in the city longer. <laughs> I wish I stayed in the city longer. I, I'm used to trips from LA to Vegas. From Honolulu to Vegas is a completely different undertaking, and I really probably could have stayed there another couple of days to let the brain cells restore themselves. But, um, other than that, um, so yeah, I talked about this show in particular a few times, uh, most notably because I made the ethically questionable decision to buy a scalped ticket. Um, just given the scarcity of the show and the fact this is kind of a once in a lifetime thing, given how rarely it is performed at all, um, I found it a worthwhile use of my money. Despite... And after seeing... Despite technically giving that money to someone who does not deserve it, and we could have a whole long discussion about how just terrible um, ticket selling practices are on a number of platforms. AXS is at least better than Ticketmaster, but like, yikes, folks just plain yikes but overall uh do you think that the money was well spent i mean i got to go to vegas i got to see some great shows um i'm going to be honest for the money i spent on the ticket i spent nearly the same amount on other stuff i did as vegas as well although that was going directly to the distributors and not to random third party who happened to be you know selling a ticket um mm. so to be perfectly honest with you, yes. Like, I knew I wanted to see it. I knew it was going to be the highlight of my trip, and it was. Um, it was great to see this live. It was great to hear these arrangements. Um, made some friends. That's always good. It was it was a good time. So I'm glad I went. Again, my my thought process was to leave this for now playing, because we've talked about prior Eorzean Symphony and prior uh, Final Fantasy XIV concerts before. But circumstances kind of push this one to the forefront. You know what? I'm totally okay with that because I do have quite a bit to say, and I'm sure you guys have plenty of commentary as well, being F14 fans as well. Mm hmm. Um. Well, let's get started with the set list then. Okay, so they went roughly in expansion order. And I say roughly because there's one song that isn't. But we opened up with, uh, Torn from the Heavens, the, like, primary, like, hard boss, like, you hear this a lot, music from A Realm Reborn that keeps getting reused. Um, it's a very good song. Uh, this one, yeah. was, this one was written by Naoshi Mizuda. I've heard this one before, even before I started playing FF14, because this one's on the Distant Worlds, uh, set list. The usual Distant Worlds set list. Soken finally made his way to Distant Worlds, and Sam, you're going to be talking about that later, I think you said, yeah? Mm-hmm. But, um... Exactly. Yep. But this was a very different mix. 
uh, compared to, uh, sorry, a very different arrangement. I don't want to say mix because there wasn't actually that much live sound reinforcement um, going on for this show because usually there aren't for symphonies. Um, there was some, obviously the flute section is going to get boosted, but for the most part, it's just clean audio. Um, so I should not use the word mix. It's a bad word to use here. I, I'm a bad sound guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, Torn for the Heavens is kind of the, like, standard issue, this is FF14 song. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, it's good to see you again. Yeah. But I'll, but I'll also say, as a person who's been paying attention to later constants of the game, it's actually the last phase of the most recent Ultimate song. Interesting. And the orchestral version, too. So the one that you heard, most people have, most people who have done Ultimate for the Omega Protocol have trauma. You know who else have heard it? The people who bought the, like, super expensive 50 million gil mounts that you can buy. Those all, <laughs> except the Namazu one, play the orchestral version of Tour from the Heavens. Oh my god. Yeah. So if you get the, like, Golden Great Spirit of Ranka, it will actually play Torn from the Heavens Orchestral. Very interesting. Which is a weird choice, but, uh... Speaking of choice of when to use the music, how do you think of that as an opener? It sets the tone, right? Like, I gotta be honest, this is a whole lot of boss music in this, uh, in this set list. This is also a whole lot of, um, it's like, it's like, um, boss music, main themes, and cities. And the cities fall off halfway through. Mm-hmm. And I think that just comes to a lot of set piece. Yeah. Uh, stuff that they do within 14 that sometimes outshines the world around it yeah and in this case heavens or heavens word in this case torn from the heavens is your kind of quintessential ff14 we're doing something heroic now music so it it does good for setting the tone the opening bars hit hard as we all know it plays through very nicely um i don't know from where i'm sitting it makes sense as an opener i i certainly there's one or two other songs I would think would make a good opener, and I didn't need to worry about it. Like, what am I going to uh -huh. do? Complain? This is a good song. It's a good song. Um, now, I regret not writing as many specific notes about performances as I would have liked, but uh -huh. uh, we will... It's like you were busy enjoying the performances or something. It's like I was busy enjoying the performances <laughs> or something. Um... And let's now, go to my starting city now. <laughs> let's go to your starting city now. Here's a song we're going to be talking about again next week, or next episode. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I... We're doing a wheel of instruments for the next episode. We've been planning this for a while. And the only reason this one made the list for next episode, assuming it still does, I may have to swap it out now that we're talking about it on this one, uh, is because it features that instrument about a minute into the song. And I was getting increasingly desperate for this instrument because it doesn't get used very much. Uh, that said, we have a new hope. The Old Da Day theme. Um, this one gets played a lot. I've heard this one on prior concert CDs of Aorzean Symphony. This is kind of one of their, like, main, main back, uh, main backbones of their set list. Yeah, but... And that kind of makes sense, given that it's a common non-boss music, but it's yeah. got that energy still. It's yeah, it, it feels full and rounded. Yeah, it's big, it's bombastic, it's got all these orchestral sweeps going on. Like, if you're going to play any song from a town on an orchestra, you'd play this. Although, I wouldn't mind hearing Limsa, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but can you truly blame them for consigning Limsa to the Shadow Realm? On an ethical level, not a musical one. <laughs> yes? Why wouldn't I want the nice beach city? I'm no just reason. Me meeting on him, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, um, 
Look, the... there's a specific server that, uh, old uh, mm, not a good no, place. No, I mean, in general, like, if there's a tone people, terrible, terrible people AFK in, it's Limsa. You're not wrong, but I've seen way more problematic content out of this town, Ulda. The amount yeah. of people who are horny on Maine, especially on Balmung, is just terrifying on, mm. in, in Ulda. It's bad. I basically have to turn general chat off, otherwise it's just nothing but text <laughs> gay porn. And I'm just like, I need to not be <laughs> this right now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Gridal. Good on them. <laughs> Please keep it private. Please keep it private. Uh, and no, no, I, we need to actually talk about the oh. music. We oh, haven't done yes. that very much. We as haven't. much as I would like oh, to boy. skip to the next song. Um, <laughs> the song itself is notably good. I find it a little more generic than um, some of the other towns, but that's not necessarily wrong. We're still kind of in the setting the tone phase. Um, and yeah, big bombastic orchestral piece for one of their most important cities. Makes sense. Um, Makes sense. And yes, the... I'm just going to talk about it. There is a xylophone section about a minute and a half in. And um, you do hear this when you're just hanging around an old uh, getting quest on or whatever. But um, I have to say this percussion player, very, very talented. Not that surprising. So yeah, this percussion player is very, very good. Very light touch. So far, um, while these have been fairly on-the-nose arrangements, they've been a lot more subtle than what Distant Worlds tends to do. I've grown, on a personal level, increasingly disillusioned with Distant Worlds. It's still great to hear the music, and I'm going to go see it again. But I mentioned this during the score concert episode a few, a few episodes ago. Um, I do find them to be a little unwilling to play around. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, and while we I'll are... have words on that later, by the way. Sure. Um, and while we are, like, this song is definitely not a play-around song. I dare say the next two are a lot more interesting in that regard. Um, this one definitely has, uh... This one definitely has enough energy to it, but also enough, um enough uh, dynamic uh, dynamic range and dynamic difference to it that the more subtle stuff comes out more than I think it does in Distant Worlds. And while this song in particular mm -hmm. I don't believe has ever been played in Distant Worlds, I'm not really sure that Arnie Roth could handle this arrangement that way. I, I He tends to have a weakness for the lighter stuff. It's either he does songs that are all light and fluffy or all big and bastic. Never really songs mm. like this which have elements of both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it definitely ebbs and flow, and that's part of the strength of the song, honestly. So yeah. yeah, if it's if the transition from one energy to the next can be handled properly, I imagine that can be either overwhelming or underwhelming. Yes, and uh, as a result, I'd like to give a shout out to this uh, conductor whose name I sadly did not remember to write down. <laughs> We weren't given programs, um, which I've, is an increasingly common problem in orchestral performances these days. Well, that's annoying. That's mm. very annoying, and that's been going on for, like, pre-pandemic. Like, you, you either have to pay for a separate playbill, most of the time your show isn't even listed in the... It's, it's bad. But this lady was a very, very good conductor. Um, I don't think she did the arrangements. I think the arrangements were done by others. Um, anyway... Uh, after this, b between songs, we had our first appearances of my nemeses, uh, Yoshi P and Christopher Michael, Christopher Michael Koji Fox. Um, they are not great on stage. I'm sorry. I just got to say it. I, I, their energy when they're like trying to be light and enter they just do not have a great onstage energy when they're not actually performing they're not good at vamping mm -hmm. to audiences i've just got to be honest about that and i don't think it's a language barrier thing because soken comes out a little later as well and he does fine so i think they're just not good vamping to audiences on this on this scale yeah um I'm also still a little angry at Yoshi P for Endwalker, 
and we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. But for um, now, let's calm down a little. Let's calm down a little and go with uh, one of the surprises of the show, which was the Gridana, Gridania area town theme. So, like, not in Gridania, but when you're in, like, the the, the farm or whatever, or... or the or Quarry Camp Tranquil. of the world. Yeah. Yeah, when you're like Camp, Camp Tranquil or Quarry Miller. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fall Guard. Uh, it played that song, which was actually kind of a shocker. Because um, that feels like a weird one to play, but I appreciate how, like, calming that energy is, right? Like, it's a good come down from Torn from the Heavens, which is very in your face, and New Hope, which is kind of in between. Um... This was also the first... Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I can definitely see a path from Torn from the Heavens to World Out to this one. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think it was very good. I think it was very good placement for... Um, I think it was very good placement for uh, for this. I, I, I think set list... Set list wise, uh, this worked out very well. Um... Yeah. And that's one thing that I was actually, like, very... I'll be very complimentary of is that the set list was very clean. Uh, and where everything was in the set list. I didn't have a situation like in the last Primals concert where I'm like, why are you playing Escape and the Twinning two songs from each other? Like, that's not great. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're just repeating yourself. Stop it. And why but, are you putting both in there? <laughs> well, I, I understand why you put both in there, but, like, my argument was they should have been much further apart in the set list, so, you know, you yeah. aren't, like immediately reminded of a song you heard two songs ago. And I yeah, will say this one also kind of has that problem something. at another point, but I understand why they did it that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this one was kind of a surprise, but this one was very chill and very vibey. And this was the first appearance of our piano. And again, it's like they had some very good instruments. Um... The piano was, uh, very strong on the waltz segment. Mm -hmm. We like a strong piano. We like a strong piano. Uh, like, I've heard some interesting piano while listening to Final Fantasy music. Um, back when he was still touring with The New World, I'm a big fan of Benjamin Noose. Um, who's done a lot of work with the Roth brothers and with Distant Worlds in Japan, at least, and a new world, you know, as a touring, as part of the touring act. Um, he's kind of my gold standard for piano, uh, when it comes to Final Fantasy concerts. Um, I say that because I have only heard one from Kaiko, and that was entirely, uh, online, so I don't really have a great live context for her, and we'll talk about that later. So, yeah, hearing a nice, like, talented, not showboating piano player is usually very good for something like this. Um, even if there wasn't a lot of star power in this particular act, at least until, at least until the second phase of it, um, I do feel like this was a stronger piece than maybe hearing it in-game gives it credit for, which I think is good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a place where uh, the more low-key uh, uh, music can shine, it is live concerts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we have uh, a song that starts very low-key and then gets not low-key at all. And that's kind of, we're having this, like, rising and falling action going on here, which I think is a really cool way to do the set list. We go into the final boss of 2.0, Ultima. And it does the full intro. Uh, the mostly acapella choir intro leading into the orchestral sweep, leading into the actual full-on boss music. Excellent, because I really like that intro. I like that I... intro a lot, too. I honestly... There are times where I enjoy listening to the original, but I also like the amount of build-up that they give for the orchestral a lot. Yeah. Um, this is one of these cases where just instrumentally the uh, orchestral mix differs from the in-game version by quite a bit. Uh, there's going to be another one of these later. 
But the biggest uh, change between these two, and I talked about this in prior episodes, actually, is the percussion. Um, you know, you have your standard issue percussion for orchestras. You have your snare, your timpani, your standing bass. Um, but mm -hmm. the in-game version actually uses more tribal drums, which mm -hmm. gives it a very interesting vibe. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, that is lost in the orchestral arrangement because they just don't have those here. Um, never mind, that would likely require additional reinforcement. Um, that said, this is where I would like to shout out the choir. Um, because doing that acapella to start, I don't know if they had a click track, but they're basically just running off of notes, sheets, and the conductor, and that's all you got, unless you have a click. Um, with no accompaniment, so that is... A very challenging thing in a lot of ways to do, especially for a song like this that doesn't have centuries of hymnal experience behind it. Yeah. Also, speaking earlier of, like, the tribal stuff, uh, the original version's actually a bit of a remix of the, so of the earlier song One Blood in that you would, like, see within, uh, like, going after Ifrit, Garuda, Titan, yeah. all that. But the orchestral version makes it its own. It makes it its own song. And yeah. not just a remix of another. And I love that. Uh, I'm not sure it's fair to call it a remix. Um, just given, like, Soken loves motifs, like, so much. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you could absolutely call Ultima by the Primals, you know, Big Fat Tacos. That's definitely a remix at that point, because that's just <laughs> rearranging the same song in a completely different context. Uh, but having some common elements, especially when trying to develop a motif, which is one of this composer's, like, favorite, like, favorite compositional tricks. Mm -hmm. I think it's a teensy bit unfair. Yeah, fair. Um. Honestly, I like the like ba 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 that that parts. The uh for the first build up into uh like witness ultimas. Uh honestly does it the best uh have listened to this arrangement so much <laughs> yeah this one's a pretty common arrangement uh this i believe a version of this one i believe this one was studio recorded however plays during ultimate weapons refrain and it's a pretty common uh -huh. staple on prior aeorzean symphony tracks like this is another one of those songs that they just like playing, and I don't blame them for liking to play it. Um, it's really this good. Was also the f this was also the first or like time that they started the tradition of putting orchestral tracks in Ultimate End Phase. Which they didn't do for Dragon Song! Technically, they did. They did. On DSR? Yeah. Revenge Twofold Orchestral. I did... The regular boss music? Uh, not heroes? Yeah. The regular boss music, not Yeah, no, they did they they did it because I think that they say they kept heroes for base uh Thornton because of the fact that people would be hearing that over and over and they didn't want to make people be like, oh god, not again for the final phase. But but, I mean, they're going to be hearing the Orchestral of Revenge Twofold again. You Not for a long time. It's a, it's a long fight. It's a long fight. Okay, you know what? I'm moving on. That was a weird choice, having that one. Um, mm -hmm. I seem to recall checking that track list. I was rather disappointed because, like, Weapons Refrain is nothing but remixes. You get the three Primals remixes and then the big Ultima music. Um, yeah. Whereas... Even Omega Protocol did 
a lot of uh their remixes. Yeah, DSR always kind of felt like it was really a victim of COVID in a lot of ways. It just did not feel musically complete to me. Like a lot of Endwalker, for being honest. I, I do have... There's a lot of Endwalker that works great with the music, but there's a couple of things that I'm just like, this feels like a rush job. Mm -hmm. Especially in regards to mounts. Um, Which... Hmm. Yeah, th that's kind of bad. It is. It really is. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and talk about this since I brought it up. Um, it still bothers me that uh, while the horse you get for four clears of Heaven on High plays something very cool and different, the cat you get from four clears of uh, Eureka Orthos does not. It plays generic mount music. Um, the Shadow Keeper, Mog Station mount, plays generic music. Uh, so many optional mounts play generic stuff. And I'm just like, why are you not hitting, like, three buttons to assign a different song to this thing? I'm very confused. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, you had a transition thing? Well, you wanted no, to that was for the last song of the next section. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, that was for Heroes, not for Ultima. Um, I will say, hearing the, uh, hearing the coda, hearing that live blasting at me, that sent shivers down my spine. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of those moments that I'm just like, okay, things are happening now. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing you came here for. That's the kind of thing I came here for. Like, there's something unique about the live experience that is, like, it's it's a high that I chase. I'll be honest about that. <laughs> um. Anyway, that's the end of our ARR segment. Uh, once again, we had the Terrible Twosome come on stage, but this time they're joined by Masayoshi Soken, where they introduce the next expansion, Heaven's Word, and they introduce one of the stars of the show and Soken's muse these days, Amanda Aiken. Uh, we've talked about her a number of times on this show. Um, I was actually fairly critical of her performance, uh, in the piano concert especially, for, um the live stream fan festa pre end walker uh, hmm. she has drastically improved uh the opening song is dragon Ooh. song which i've also heard with distant worlds but in that case with susan calloway the original singer who i've been very open about not liking yes and let me tell you hearing this song with a singer i actually like man that's a different experience well, that's intriguing, given that I'm honestly not the greatest fan of Dragon Song. I didn't think I, I was either. I'm a little on the side of actually really liking it, but on only on really certain occasions. I will say uh, I'm a little annoyed at it that it blocked my uh, clear video on YouTube for... Um, for uh, Final Steps of Faith EX, first clear. <laughs> oh. I was deeply annoyed by this. Uh, apparently that song is like, it got copyright stricken, and I'm just like, a chunk of my clear is muted because of an in-game song. I don't know who yeah, I should be yelling at about hard this. for the uh, main themes, like, answer will get you next, this. Yeah. yeah. But honestly, a lot of the raid music is usually not as strikeable. I've never had a strike problem on the raid music. Um, but that was one of the reasons I kind of stopped doing YouTube clear videos. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, so I'm not sure how much I, I, I will kind of agree that I'm not sure how much I like this song in general. But it felt good to actually appreciate it for once. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, because with Susan Calloway on vocals, my annoyance is just like answer. I'm just like, please get off the microphone. You are not good live. Go away. Um, very rarely do I say that. Like, I think you guys know me. Yeah. I, I usually, when I hear something live, it affects me on a personal level differently. In this case, Susan Calloway's voice just makes me just so annoyed that she just, I just shut down when she's singing. That was not the case with Amanda Aiken. It was a much more pleasant voice and, frankly, a lot more powerful of a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a much better belter. Um... So this one was good to hear. Not my favorite, but, you know, I do appreciate it with the new singer. And they kept her on for the following song, Heaven's Word, which they used the trailer mix and actually played the trailer in the background while this was going on. <laughs> which was an interesting choice. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the video too much, but there will be a couple points where I do have to bring up the video. Uh, Heaven's Word was good. Um... What was interesting is because it's the trailer mix, she actually leaves the stage halfway through the song. <laughs> uh, which is a... Qu I don't want to say a questionable decision, but, like... Man... I mean, it's that or stand awkwardly. It I is guess. that or stand awkwardly, <laughs> but um, this would be a case where maybe a little play with the mix would have been welcome to let her continue. Mm. Um... Or maybe she joins the choir. That wouldn't have worked. Uh, yeah, no, it's a male yeah. choir. Yeah, it's a, it's a fixed choir, and the only other time mm -hmm. I've seen I've seen someone do that was uh, in uh, Distant Worlds. One of them actually had Uematsu San present, and he went up to the choir. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I found that incredibly embarrassing. Mm. Uh given that he wasn't a regular part of this unit, and that it was for One Winged Angel, and that song is so overplayed it hurts. Um... So... Like, they clearly just did it for the meme. So having her, like, just physically also just getting to the choir would almost require her going backstage, circling around, and returning to the stage. So I think... Which would be very much a hassle it would be a hassle so no i don't think having her join the choir would have been a good choice here but maybe a rearrangement that brings her in again towards the end would have been good mm -hmm. um now what i found interesting is that you know we just talked about revenge twofold orchestral obviously that shares the same rough refrain as, that shares the same motif and refrain as Heaven's Word, so we kind of got to hear that as part of the song as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously not the full song. Um. Then they played the 3.0 final boss music, Heroes. Um. I don't know what I think about this live mix, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of it because it feels like it ends way too abruptly. I didn't have this particular problem with uh, this song. Maybe they maybe they changed the arrangement. That wasn't really the thing. I just felt that the arrangement itself was. It's hard for me to describe in words. It was a little underwhelming, and I kind uh -huh. of think I know the reason why. Uh, and we'll be talking about Go that later, on. actually. Don't go on. <laughs> um, all right, I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, the encore was the final day, the end singer's music. And I say that with as much air quotes as I can possibly give it. Um, and Heroes is part of that medley. And I feel like that arrangement was actually stronger. So I kind I of feel uh -huh. like they undersold this arrangement to give more credence to that one. Or at least, maybe uh, not give it more credence, but at the very least, let them breathe differently from each other. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the one thing I would be very complimentary of when it comes to heroes is the horn section. Mm -hmm. um, love a good horn. Love a good horn. We've done a few episodes on horn-related instruments before. 
Um, now, here's my anecdote that I was going to talk about my segue. Uh, before the concert, I was feeling really tired because that was a day where my body was just like, nah, man, you're not allowed to have energy. Good luck. So, at the Virgin Hotels... I mean, given the temperature that were reported around these parts these days, I honestly can blame you. It was 110 Fahrenheit outdoors. <laughs> 110 Fahrenheit. Oh, I don't yeah, know. that's a no. reasonable temperature to cook. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm very glad my hotel of choice, the signature at MGM, has good air conditioning. And, um... You know what? Okay, I'll talk about this. It's a completely different segue and quasi unnecessary and may get cut. But um, if I tried to catch an Uber from the signature, I'd have to go outside and wait outside. So instead, I tend to make the personal decision of walking all the way to the regular MGM, which is a good almost a kilometer walk from Tower 2. Like it's it's maybe not a full kilometer, but it's like three quarters of a kilometer to the Uber stop in the regular MGM. Um, to go to that Uber pickup, which is in their covered garage, which is still, like, hot, but it has shade. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was willing to walk that distance in the air conditioning as opposed to waiting outside. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. in that heat, that's not going to do me any good. Um, anyway, so I get to the Virgin Hotels, and I'm tired, and I'm actually, like... There were two performances of Eorzean Symphony. Uh, there was a 4.30 show, and I was there for the 7.30 show. Or something like that. And I actually mm -hmm. find myself at Dunkin' Donuts in the Virgin Hotels, uh, where this concert's going to be taking place, the theater at, at, at Virgin, with two members of the horn section of the orchestra. One oh. gentleman in his 60s, who I believe he was on trombone, and then one of their tuba players, a whopping 19 years old. Uh-huh. Wow. And I'm I... like, this kid must be some kind of genius to be playing symphony-level work at 19. Um, and sure enough, during Respect. this song, which has quite a bit of tuba, I was actually watching for this kid, and he, he, <laughs> he acquitted himself well. Mm-hmm. Um... I also overheard him say, I didn't, I didn't butt in and comment like, oh, I can help with that. But I overheard him say that he was actually interested in transitioning to engineering. And I'm just like, all right, kid, you and me, <laughs> we're, we're on the same page. I like you. Did you get their phone number? No, no, nothing like that. Okay. We were just chatting in line for coffee. Fair enough. Uh, one more thing before we move on, by the okay. way. Uh, so, I was going to bring up this up a little later, but, uh, during the time that I was at the Distant Worlds concert, back in the end of June, yes, I'm talking that far back, what of it, uh, I got to hear the live version of Dragon Sog there. And I figured, found out something very interesting. Hmm. Susan Calloway is the Detroiter. So, they were able to bring her in very easily, apparently. I assume you ah. saw this in the Detroit area? Oh, yeah, because, I mean, I live uh, in Metro Detroit. That I feels like important background information. It does. <laughs> you realize you're only the second American on this show ever, right? Uh, you know what? Fair. Uh, yes, I'm in, the, I'm in America's the number two. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in the Metro Detroit area. I saw it at the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, and apparently they were able to bring in Susan Calloway pretty easily because of the fact that she was there. In yeah, I mean, if she's around, what are they yeah. gonna do? Not use her? I mean, pretty yeah. much. Um. I had a similar I, situation in a... Go ahead, go ahead, continue. I I like I liked her performance. I definitely do now understand the live nature of her power versus how it's mixed whenever mm -hmm. you hear it uh, through uh, audio files. Yeah. Like 
mixing, mixing, mastering, processing, all of that does a lot of work behind the scenes that I think people definitely underestimate. Mm hmm. But it was still pretty, it was still pretty good. The orchestra did a fantastic job there. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I had a similar kind of situation uh, at a rock concert I was at ages ago. Uh, I was seeing a band that Eddie and I actually became friends over, a band called Delane. Um, we became friends with each other as fans of that band. And I was seeing them at their show in Los Angeles at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And one of their songs features Burton C. Bell from Fear Factory. And this is not a song they play live very much because Burton doesn't really travel anymore. He doesn't really tour anymore. Um, that said, he lives in Los Angeles, so they managed to get him on stage and actually perform that song on stage. Uh, sometimes you just take someone who's around to make something special happen, and I think, I, I always like it when that happens. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, now we move on to what ended up being my, actually my favorite segment of the, uh, my favorite segment of the concert, which was Stormblood. Um, it's looking like a very strong segment, honestly. It's, it's a very strong it, segment. Uh, I'm usually on the critical side when it comes to Stormblood's music. Um, but I will say, when Stormblood gets it right, they get it super, ultra, omega, yes, right. Um, mm -hmm. And this was... They, they just played three bangers. From Stormblood is what they did. They skipped one of their biggest bangers. For reasons that are honestly kind of confusing given the rest of the set list. Um, as I mentioned, the finale is the final day. The second encore. Which plays segments from Ultima, Heroes, The Worm's Tale, Invincible. Much like the looping segment of the song itself, The Worm's Tale was omitted. I say the looping segment yeah. because at least in the final day, um, you at least get the opening of the Worm's Tale as the opening to the song. This was the one time they didn't do this. Was for this part. Huh. Um, that said, what they did play were great, and we're going to start with uh, Triumph, the regular boss music, which is always good. Indeed. Um, I'm very complimentary of this boss music. It's it's up there for me. It's probably it's among my favorites. It's it's somewhere in my top three of regular boss regular just dungeon boss music. I enjoy this track a lot and I will always laud it uh as one of my favorite boss tracks just for It's got that heavy feel to it. Yeah. And good driving music to help push the player forward. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, this one kind of gets most of our Stormblood themes in here. Most notably, this is the only appearance of the actual Stormblood refrain. Which you would think would have been reprised in The Worm's Tale had they included in the set list. Of course. Um, mm -hmm. which actually will lead to a surprise for the next song on this list, but for this first one, I mean, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, yeah, I was very happy with this arrangement. Um, now I have heard from you, Sam, that this actually made the cut of Distant Worlds now. Yeah. So you talked earlier about Soken finally getting arrangements into there, and actually, it's the Eorzean Symphony arrangement <laughs> that they used uh, for Distant Worlds. Oh, uh, So, Ari. I was... Sorry, go I on. was... I was super... I, I was excited to hear about that, but... Uh, I, I knew it was the Eorzean Symphony because I've listened to, like, the album track that... Uh, people put onto, like, YouTube and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and heard Triumph Orchestral. So, yeah. <sighs> so that tells me that Lazy Old Arnie is continuing to be lazy and he just borrowed someone else's arrangement instead of doing his own. 
No wonder it never made the cut. Because mm. he has his own arrangement of Torn from the Heavens, and he has his own arrangement of, uh... I forget the name of the song. Primal Fury, I think it is. Um, Ifrit's yeah. theme. Uh, and a couple other uh, songs Primal like Judgment. that. Primal Judgment. Uh, uh, but, dra like, Dragon Song, uh, Triumph, and one other song that we would talk about later made mm -hmm. the cut. Yeah. Well, well, Dragon Song was Uematsu, so that's not that surprising. Yeah. Um, it's just Soken composed or arranged is usually a lot is usually something that Distant Worlds has kind of managed to avoid. Um, weirdly enough, this is not something that a new world, the Chamber Orchestra Tour, has ever had a problem with. They've had a piano arrangement of Heroes performed by Benjamin Noose. They've had uh, Crimson Sunrise as one of their, like, more common tracks that they play at A New World, etc., etc., etc. So they've never had that problem. Uh, but Distant Worlds has usually had this issue, and I don't know if there was some, like, licensing thing going on between Arnie Roth and Soken. I'm not sure what the reason why is, but usually the FF14 representations have been composed by everybody but Masayoshi Soken when it comes to that and concert they did tour. Me and they did mention that they were in talks with Soken to get arrangements for 60. I'll bet you that's what put it over the top. Is they're working towards a uh, they're working towards a sixteen show or at the very least including sixteen in distant worlds. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you that's what did it. Um, and from Triumph, which was just a really great, solid, strong boss track, we're going to go to the biggest surprise of the night. Uh, normally, when you think of like Stormblood area themes, the one everyone thinks of is the one I just mentioned, Crimson Sunrise. That's kind of Soken's baby. It's one of his favorite songs. Uh, we recently had a dungeon where he decided to remix it again because, you know, why do something new or anything? <sighs> anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, where did that come from? Yeah, I wonder. Uh, so, instead of playing Crimson Sunrise, which was like the most obvious pick on the planet, they went a different direction and they played Songs of Salt and Suffering, the music for the locks. I was. Give some love to Alamigo. Yeah. I'm that weirdo Alamigo fan. Like, I know I'm in the minority when it comes to this fan base. So hearing this song just put the biggest grin on my face. I'm a big fan of just all the culture. I'm a big fan of all the cultures, and Alamigo is just incredible. So I'm with you on... In being an Alamigo enjoyer. Yeah, I've heard so much pushback. And Sorry, go on. Just in general, it's nice to see some swerves that uh, uh, we, the kind of music we're just happy to see, like, oh, didn't expect that. That's mm -hmm. an excellent one. Yeah. And I feel one that helps uh, really show the strength of the orchestra. Yes. Uh, this is a song that, much like uh, A New Hope and much like Serenity, has a lot of subtlety to it, even if it is a lot heavier and a lot more tense and foreboding than those other two songs. Um, this one sounds very militaristic. It sounds like you're in a war camp, which, admittedly, for a lot of this area in-game, you kind of are. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it does a very good job of portraying that. Uh, but the orchestra really did kind of do a lot with this one and make it appealing and interesting. Um, this was... I would say uh, this was one of three surprises we had of the night. The first one being Serenity, this being the second, and then the third one in the Endwalker segment, in the section, which I didn't think they would have added to their list. Um, Honestly, hearing uh, that uh, this was in makes me hopeful one day we'll get a live version of uh, the filthy mean Galmal. Ooh, that'd be cool. I'd be up for that. I would I'd be, up, be for that. Super up for that. Um, and I feel like if this were a touring show, uh, like Distant Worlds, we'd probably have a lot more deep cuts like that. Um, that said, FF14 is such a massively stacked, um, soundtrack that picking and choosing is mildly terrifying. 
Yeah, I mean, it got uh, most original songs in a single video game Guinness World Record f- two expansions ago. Yeah, there's no sign oh. of slowing down. <laughs> so, picking a set list um, for a concert, sewer, like, a concert series like this, especially given their comparative rarity, unlike Distant Worlds, which performs every month or so, yeah, that's 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 a that's a challenge. Um, so here and getting song, something like this on it, yeah, it was just such a surprise. Uh, and they acquitted themselves well. They got the that opening with the with the snare with the march sound that worked out really well, and the lighter segments. That, this was this was one of the stronger tracks on the. Uh, this was one of the stronger tracks on the the set list. To be perfectly honest with you, I would say it's my favorite, but. That's not actually true, <laughs> and uh, we'll come to why in the very next song, but for now, um, yeah, hearing some rarity is nice. It, it feels good that this set list wasn't suffering from Camelot Syndrome, and for those who don't know what I mean by that, there is a heavy metal band I like called Camelot, another, fan, another band that Eddie and I are both fans of, though mostly different eras, I think. Um... They have a bad what habit. What I've heard of them, I've liked it. Fair enough. Uh, for their live sets, however, they have a very bad habit, and that is they will play nothing but their biggest hits and songs from their new album. That is it. No deep cuts. Mm. This gets tedious very quickly, uh, to the point where I've nicknamed a set list like that Camelot Syndrome, because it's just so safe. Um, they're not playing anything... So we like avoiding that. We like avoiding that. We don't want to catch Camelot yeah. Syndrome. Um... So, yeah. Now, of course, there's probably going to be a way to compensate, and uh, after that... Uh... I imagine the next uh, song will be a way to wind down for, from that, and uh, maybe something that has an increased energy, but you're not as enthusiastic about, like Escape, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, they totally played Escape. No, wait, they didn't. No, they didn't play 011, they played 012. Savage. Woo! Um... So this was also a surprise, but for completely different reasons. Uh, for those of us who played FF14, you'll notice that every song up to this point has been MSQ required. You can't skip anything here. Y- you can totally skip 012 Savage. That is optional content. That's about as optional as it gets. It's about as optional as it gets. And, uh... Man, uh, so I've been pretty open about the fact that from the heavens, the, you know, from the heavens, the music for O12 Savage, Omega 12 Savage, is my favorite song in the entire soundtrack, all five expansions and everything else of it. Which is about as high praise as I can give a song from a soundtrack this diverse and massive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um... This is my... So how does the live version stacks up? Let me tell you, hearing that opening just hit me like a ton of bricks. I... I didn't expect to be in the room by this point hearing this song. I I fully expected this to be the Worm's Tale, because they've been... Again, everything else has been MSQ required so far. Uh, MSQ, sorry, for those who don't play FF14, though I don't know why you're listening to this particular episode, stands for Main Story Quest. I should clarify that. Um... Man from the heavens is wild. Um, so this only appears on Savage, by the way. This doesn't appear on Normal Mode. Normal Mode has a song called Heartless, which I also really like. It um, does appear in Ultimate. Heartless? Or, I mean, I, I'm sure Heartless and From the Heavens both appear in Ultimate. It'd be silly not to. But the orchestral version appears in Ultimate. Of which one? Of, of from the heavens. From the heavens. Okay, good. Yeah, I would. I would hope so. This one's been on the. This one's been on the set list before. I've heard uh, my my volume two CD has this song on there. Um. This is one of the scarier songs 
on the soundtrack as well. This one almost sounds like a horror, like a, I don't want to say a horror, but, um, the song it reminds me of, weirdly enough, is, um, I forget the name of it, but the big battle for the Matrix, Resol uh, the Matrix Revolutions, the third one that no one liked. Um, that particular song with the just hopeless war against the machines, it's got yeah, that... Yeah, it's good that ominous feel. Yeah, it's like you are up against something that's way out of your league, theoretically. Mm-hmm. Frickin'. Something that will be able to adapt to you over and over and mm -hmm. over again until you are out of anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't want to fight anymore. He wants your gun. Yeah. Um... And it sounds like it. Uh, and this one combines a lot of different things. It combines f Torn from the Heavens. It combines original stuff. There's actually the original Final Fantasy Prelude hidden in a what's usually a harp sequence in the studio version of the song. Though I've got to be honest, they cut that out for this version. Uh, I was noticing, I was paying attention to the harpist and she was not performing for this part. Um... um. But do you know the part where it goes bum 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 ba da da? Yeah. That part. Uh, that's the transition in from phase three to phase four, which they continue the song and continue that build up until the enrage of that phase. <laughs> nice. Um, which makes it all the more tense. Oh, yeah. Because so, you have to get the boss below a certain percentage before it just wipes you instantly. Um, now, again, I'm not as familiar with Omega Protocol. Uh, I'm not really yeah. an Ultimate guy. Mostly I listen to Ultimate for the soundtracks, and yeah. I kind of didn't care that much with, uh, with DSR just because it had one remix in it the entire time that I wasn't even actually aware was in, the, in there until now. So I hadn't paid attention to Ultima, or not Ultima, sorry, I hadn't paid attention to Omega. Also because of the cheating scandal kind of soured me to the whole thing. And then they memed on it. <laughs> they memed on it. Uh, I still think that's great. Uh, for those who don't know what that means, for one thing, after the cheating went on, there was a lot of memes coming along. Of like astronaut memes and space memes just dunking on the cheaters who got... World Due first. to the fact that the cheat used was uh, unlocked or uh, unlock of the camera in order to have a clearer perspective of the situation mm -hmm. from up top and from very far, meaning that you could have a vision of the whole arena, which normally is almost but not quite possible. Right. Uh, and then from what I understand, in P12 Savage, there's a mechanic that actually mimics that as well. There's yes. an in-game mechanic that makes fun of that. And I'm just like, you know you guys messed up when even the developers are making fun of you with their content. <laughs> like, that is a level of dunking that I am, I was not prepared for. Yeah. And it's immortalized. They, like, it's not gonna mm -hmm. ever go away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zoom out on our watch, how dare you? But yeah, this is, this is definitely one of the most complex songs in the in the game just in general because there's so many different movements and so many different textures within those movements um if anything this actually kind of reminds me of a new hope from Ulda, because that similarly has like the bigger segments the quieter segments but just taken to 11 um it really is kind of a masterpiece no we said it was 12. Ah. Boo. <laughs> Ah, uh, grumble, grumble, grumble. But yeah, well, um... Yeah. Go on. Uh, no, go ahead. But yeah, so that's my favorite song on the soundtrack, and honestly, my favorite song of the night. I'm just gonna be straight about that. Um... I, I don't blame you. I mean, they just kind of nailed it. Uh, and from here, we move on from Stormblood to Shadowbringers. Now, this one was a little weirder as arrangements go, because the next two songs are guitar-driven rock songs in the main soundtrack. 
So the orchestral mixes of these are a little wacky. Um, mm -hmm. And that brought the other star of the show, the great and mighty Jason Charles Miller, who's become a minor community meme in my in my community. Just because he keeps popping up on everything. <laughs> well, he popped up big beard and cowboy hat and all to sing the next two songs, Shadowbringers and To The Edge. Which sounds like an excellent way to introduce our fourth guest in this podcast, Jason. No, just <laughs> that would have been amazing. I, if you, yeah, yes. no, he's not here. No, that was not. That was a joke. If you, some, abort, abort. If you somehow, if you somehow dragged him in here, I would have lost my mind. I would have fanboyed out. You can't do that to me unprepared. <laughs> but um. Yeah, hearing Shadowbringers without guitar, especially since that opening guitar riff is so iconic. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, however, that it was the, again, the trailer version of Shadowbringers, so it does go into the full song. But it starts with a cut from Tomorrow Tomorrow that usually has Amanda on there, but she didn't come back out for this part. That was handled by the choir. Um, and it was a little weird. I like it. I did like it. I don't know how I feel about this one. This one just seems a little... My issue with this is the exact opposite of Ultima the Primals. Um, and that is you take this guitar-driven rock song and you take the rock elements out but keep the notes and play it by orchestra. It just feels weird. It feels uncanny. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, we live in a world where... Metallica slapdash S and M concert where they just threw orchestra on their own regular music makes more sense than these arrangements. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, how did you like the Eternal Wind section? I remember that being good on the stuff I heard on YouTube. The Eternal. Oh, uh, fine. I I I got to be honest. I wasn't. That didn't stick to my memory in any real way. I actually Fair almost enough. paused and went, wait, there was an Eternal Wind section? I, I I, can't say I remember that. That's not the part of the song I'm mostly familiar with. Um, usually when I listen to the song, I'm listening to the, start, the part that starts at Hades, uh, Who Brings Shadow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it was fine. It was, I, I don't know, this arrangement doesn't do anything for me, despite... I don't want to say something as awful as Jason Charles Miller was wasted here, because that's just horribly reductive, and he's an amazing performer, and oh my god, I got to see him live, and he's great. I just feel like these arrangements just didn't live up to what came before, and what he's capable of. Yeah, like... I can't accept and even very much enjoy turning something more rock-like into something more symphonic, but here the... Uh guitar and the rock aspect feels like part of the song's identity. Yeah, it's just too intertwined with the song itself. Yeah. Exactly. Um, by comparison, the first time I heard this live, and I say that in quotes, was the the, the live stream from the FanFesta pre-Endwalker where they started with the guitar riff and then Jason Charles Miller came in and that's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. That's just incredible yeah. how that feels. I would have loved mm -hmm. to have heard that. Square. <laughs> I'm going to hold off on my rage for now because it's coming, but, um... <laughs> but, um, in this case, I feel like... Shadowbringers kind of got away with it-ish. Like, if I squint at it because they were using the trailer version. But the lack of guitar really did hurt it, and it just had a completely different energy. Similarly, you have this next song, which is, like, right out of 2000's alt-rock, and that's To The Edge. And I'm going to say something really controversial. They should have cut this. Huh. This was my least favorite song of the night. This was not a good. This was not a good arrangement for this track. The only reason why it's really here is because this is the first time that it's actually getting played live. Yes. Well, sort of. It was also so. at the Primals concert, but. Well, this version. Yes. No, I I agree. Like I get why they did it, but I feel like. 
like much like Equilibrium from uh, that one Primal's concert where the the singer Gun, I believe his name was, was just just horribly off key. Um, this is another one of these cases where it's like this didn't click. This is Which is weird because unlike Shadowbringers, where I don't see a symphonic wave that can really work, I can see a world where there's a symphonic version of To the Edge that's simply excellent. Unfortunately, that's not the world we're living in, because we got this version, um, which felt really tinny. It was really, like, lows, light, like there wasn't a whole lot of low instruments. The arrangement just felt really thin. Uh, Jason was giving it everything he had, but the fact that a chunk of the lyrics and even intonation were shared from the song he just got done playing, it felt like he was repeating himself. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah, and between those two, I feel like there should have been something to put some space in. Yeah, and there wasn't. They just left. He didn't even leave the stage. He just stayed up when the next song the, started. It's the escape and long fall problem. Exactly. Uh, it needed some spacing. And I get, like, from a technical level why they did, because Jason was right there and they didn't want to pull him off and bring him on twice in a row. This is exactly what they did in Heavensward with Amanda and had her for two songs in a row. Um... So I, I get the logic behind this. Like, I'm not, like, entirely scratching my beard here, but, like, I've got to be honest. I feel like the concert probably would have been better served if this got cut and they put in promises to keep instead. And while that does mm-hmm. mean Jason has one less song, which is kind of a shame, that song's really underrated and Eden got completely unrepresented because now that we're done with From the Heavens... We're back to, there's no optional content anymore. Everything here is going to be main quest required again. Um, I feel like having a little more of that off-the-wall energy would have been appreciated, especially during Shadowbringers. Because Shadowbringers and To the Edge do share so many elements, it feels a little samey. Honestly, I, and it's, I, I, I really wish that they made promises to keep orchestral arrangement. Holy hell. That would have been nice. That's just such a different song for them. Overall, it's weird. It feels like they really don't know what to do with Aiden now that he's done. Make it mandatory. They really need to at this point. Especially with what's coming up! Yeah, we're gonna have this whole, like, Reen and Gaia thing, and if Gaia hasn't been introduced to the players, that's gonna get weird fast. Especially with, like, Eden, or just having Eden completed and able to work. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't done that, 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 that's dumb. Yeah, it's just gonna make... It's going to make no sense, since I can't imagine Gaia, the Oracle of Darkness, is not going to have a role here in what we're going to be seeing from what little we've seen in 6.5. Why wouldn't they use her? She's, like, perfect for the job. Um, gonna, I'm going to have words if they don't. I would agree here. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would say To the Edge was... I, I don't know if there's a better arrangement. Uh, Rana, you seem fairly convinced of that, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to buy that idea, but, like, that's not the arrangement I heard. I, this was my least yeah. favorite track of the show by a wide margin. On the other hand, the back half was a lot more interesting. Uh, we start with Invincible. Okay, Which well. Which actually also appeared on the Distant Worlds. Yeah. Um... Now this one, funny enough, was actually on the Stormblood, Dis- uh, Stormblood um, Eorzean Symphony concert, the Volume Two, which tells me that concert was so late, Shadowbringers was already far enough along or even released that they could add that to that set list. So this isn't the first time I've heard this version of the song, but it is the first time I've heard it live. And how was it? I mean, it was invincible. That's. <laughs> it's really good, but we've already heard this main theme and elements twice now from Shadowbringers and To the Edge. So now we're really kind of, this is another one of these cases where the motif is kind of becoming overpowering. We have three songs in a row with elements of this motif in it. I love this song, but this is another argument to have cut. I cut probably To the Edge would have been my cut, as I said. Um, that said, take it on its own. The song is great. This is, this has always been one of the standout songs from Shadowbringers for me. 
Uh, both halves of the Hades suite, just excellent in their own ways. Um, and this one is just like, here, have orchestral bombing. Enjoy. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like It was yeah, built that, as concert Yeah, that's the kind of bait. song that was made for this. Yeah. It was built as concert bait. Yeah, it really was. Um, and I feel they did a much better job for this song as concert bait than they did with um, P4 the as concert bait. Oh. Yeah, P4 is Primal's P4? concert bait. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um... I'm very cynical about the P4 music. Um, I think it's called Here Be Lions in English. It's it's written yeah. in Latin, I think, or Greek or something. Uh, Hic sunt leones. That. Uh, but apparently uh, Scream made it onto the Primals concert this year. I'm going to Scream. That's not something I'm... <laughs> oh, mother. Zen. Zen. Find Zen. <laughs> Hold it. The rant is coming soon. It's coming. Oh, you just soon. said the wrong thing to me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now my I'm blood's sorry. boiling a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool so I there. think the point we're trying to say is that Invisible was a great pig that was maybe a little bit Whose impact was a little bit attenuated by the two songs that came prior. Correct. Um, Which feels a bit wrong, given the songs and Jason Charles Miller, but still. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that it feels really wrong to say, given the presence of Jason Charles Miller and his just incredible live presence, but not even he could save To The Edge. He gave it his all, too. Um, Like, no, no negative comments about his performance. That man is excellent. Clearly. But yeah, and then after Invincible, now we can go with the set transition, which was on the subject of continuing motifs, Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which... Uh, I mean, you had to get Amanda's, like, big song on here. Um, this yeah. was the one they originally hired her for, because prior to this, she wasn't singing anything for this show, at least, that she'd been originating. Those were both not her. This was her. Um, so yeah, this was the first one she'd actually done herself and she was the lead on and of course she nailed it uh she nailed it before back in the you know i believe it was the piano concert in her case back in uh the live streamed one back when she was still a redhead i regret that she's not a redhead have i mentioned this woman's gorgeous sorry yeah this is the one time i'm going to bring this up vegas especially puts me in a pervy frame of mind so i'm going to try to keep that to that one statement. I mean... That's what the city's for. You're not wrong. That and taking your money with gambling. You're also not wrong. Honestly, I'm... if... If that's the choice between those two... Yeah. Put away, my friend. Yeah, the closest thing I did to gambling was doing my Arknights pulls while in Vegas. For the new character. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, um... So yeah, obviously she's excellent on this one. This is like her song uh, on the Shadowbringer soundtrack. So, um, this woman has pipes. Like, I mentioned again during that Primals concert that I found that she was pitchy. Um, to this day, I still go back and listen to um, Titania. I forget the name of that song, but um, she was Wayne just... Wakes me. Thank you. She was not a good fit for that song. I'm going to stand by that. Her vocal range isn't there for it. She's not whimsical enough. She's a she's a power hitter. Um, and while her you know regular personality is rather goofy, her singing style is not. Uh, she's not a whimsical singer. She's better at more serious efforts like this one, and that was made very clear because she absolutely slammed this. Wonderful. I mean. Yeah, like you said, she was in her territory, so it makes sense that it worked yeah. out. Um, and it's no secret that she's kind of been, um, she's kind of been Soken's muse for a while now. Um, it helps that I'm pretty sure this was written with her singing in mind. 
And I know for a fact her mm. next and final performance absolutely was. Um, but for now, we have a few songs 100%. before that happens. Now we go into Endwalker, a expansion which I have a very acrimonious relationship at this point. Uh, but one thing I will say is usually very good about Endwalker is the music. And we include what I would describe as my last surprise of the night. And I did not actually expect them to play Your Answer, the boss fight with Heidelin. Honestly, a very good pick. A very good pick. Usually they play the original Uematsu track, Answers. You know, because that's the big ARR, big even pre-ARR. I think that one actually debuted at 1.0. Literally the, the song that got me into the game. Yeah. Um, I have my issues with it, and that those issues are Susan Calloway. Um... But in the case of your answer, this has been a very strong remix, basically from the beginning. Um, and I kind of wasn't expecting it because it's not as big and bombastic or as talked about by the fandom as the final day or as end caller. Um, so I'm glad this made the cut. This is one of these weirdo songs that I'm actually very happy is here. Yeah, it's powerful, but it's a bookend and not... Uh... It's not something that kind of stands on its own, but that, with the context of uh, all we know about the game around, gains its uh, gravitas, if that makes sense. Yes. And I, and I wish that it was, like, either the first phase of the final boss, or just the final boss music. Yeah, uh, there's a version of Endwalker where the story is rearranged, where the final boss is the first phase is this, and the back phase is some kind of version of Flow. Because I've said pretty much from the beginning, I feel like Heidelin's probably your final opponent, and instead she was relegated to near the end boss, um, with a really generic test you to see if you can survive what's next and gave you my blessing story that I think kind of undersells just how complicated a character she was. Yes. Um, Hermes did everything wrong. Yeah, Hermes is... Uh, we're not talking about Hermes right now. <laughs> and I will just leave it at that. Yes. Hermes did everything wrong. Endwalker. Just Endwalker, man. Um, but yeah, no, one thing I don't hate about Endwalker is this music. Um, and this song is... A very interesting pick, and I'm glad they played it. Uh, Harkening back to ARR, while still maintaining its own identity. I also want to give a big shout-out to the timpani drummer on this one, because there's that big, like... I don't want to call it a timpani solo, but there's definitely, like, the big timpani section during uh, both the... going into the main uh, phrase and uh, during the bridge. So this, this, this percussionist was playing their heart out, so big thumbs up there. Um, the choir also nailed it, even though they aren't as present as they are on regular answers. But when they do come yeah. in, they come in strong. I don't know what to say here, other than I'm glad they played this one. I have been enjoying the, the arrangement ever since they've brought it out. Yeah. And, like, between this and, well, the song that we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. uh, I think that they're specific Endwalker boss themes are some of the best arrangements of them, of the whole expansion. I am inclined to agree. Honestly. Yeah, I feel like the boss themes in this expansion are definitely definitely really stand out basically throughout. There's one out of everything, there's one boss theme I kind of don't like, and that's Rubicante's. And that's yeah, just because I find it to be a weirdo remix. But that's... Which, it's only a weirdo remix because of the fact that it was uh, playing off of a old, commu like, old like community thing. Yeah. And they even brought on the person who made said community thing for said thing. Yeah, it was... That, that particular one's a little meme-y. Um, I don't mind it or hate it. I just... It's my least favorite boss track of Endwalker so far. That's kind of in the case of the, the least good of a good thing. Um, and your we'll answer... We'll see what Zeromas has. Yeah, we'll see what Zeromas has. And your answer just feels like it's one of those songs that um, doesn't get enough credit 
where it's kind of due. Um, so I found myself very pleased this one made the set list and was performed as competently as it was. Um, and then after this, a song that I have tried so hard to like over and over again. And this one's just personal taste. And that they have tried so much to make you like over and over again. They really have. But this one is another case of Jason Charles Miller could not save this song. I I heard the original in-game version. I heard a different mix of this one. I heard him play this one as an acoustic solo track at some con or another. And now I've heard him play this with an orchestra. And this is close to the distance. And I give up. I, I just can't with this song. I try really hard, and it's just not... I think one of the ways that I enjoy it is probably its biggest indictment for being in the concert, which is that I waited soon after the expansion released for the... Uh, Omega Fate uh, that gives you that uh, TV mount. Right. And uh, that was a long wait. That was four hours in this zone with this song. And I didn't get bored of it. And I didn't find it was too present. And that's, that means it's pleasant, yes. But also that it's kind of just there. It's kind of just there. I'll be honest, my personal feelings of this song, I I started a lot more negative on this one. I This one started bothering me very fast, and now I think I might actually hate it. Um, I wish mm -hmm. I didn't, because I, you know, objectively, this was extremely well performed. Again, Jason Charles Miller is incredible. Um, I like the arrangement, at least on a technical level. It did a lot of things right, but in terms of actually listening to it, it's like, please go away. And I hate that I feel like this. I really do try with this one. I gave I it think that every just, chance I could. A lot a lot of it is just because Ultima Thule and its relationship to the song. That doesn't help. And Yeah. Um, if this song was in a diff it was in a different area that actually had meaning. Yeah. Besides sacrificing every single one of your friends one by one for no reason. Yeah, it was so... Like, okay, I talked about this before. I found this just nakedly, emotionally manipulative. And I knew right out of the gate this would have no lasting consequence. And I'm just like, well, now that I know that, it's like, okay, well, my heartstrings are not tugged. Can you please shut up and move on? Um, so that didn't help. <laughs> Which is weird, because... The elements of the zone itself, uh, like, the They're... story about the dragons and the air yeah, were cool. Yeah. Why could it, like, the, the, the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem with Ultima Thule is that they kill off any chance of us going to any of those worlds. Well, on the one hand, yes, no, but let's... on the other hand, we do have the Omicron slash everyone else, really, um, Beast Tribe, which does kind of do a very good job fleshing out all of these worlds, including ones yes. uh, fought in the Dead Ends. And that is the last we're going to talk about the zone itself, because yes. it's not part of the concert per se. Not part of the concert, and this is not a Final Fantasy fourteen podcast, this is a music podcast. Thank you, Rana, for keeping us on track. <laughs> You're welcome. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, I objectively, I, I I hold this song in the exact same content, the, the exact same category as the Social Network, the film uh, by David Fincher and starring uh, Jesse Eisenberg. Um, mm -hmm. On a technical level, I love everything about it, but actually hearing it and per seeing it performed live, I I hate that I didn't enjoy this. I want to so badly. This is no indictment on on a technical level. Only my personal taste, and my personal taste is heck this song. I feel you. And I feel bad saying it because it's got so many fans. And they're not wrong I... either. It's it's not like my it's not like my um it's not like my relationship with the Yakuza franchise. It's certainly a certain subset of that franchise where I'm just like, how are you like this? No, I understand why people like this song. I just don't, and I feel bad that I don't. I enjoy the Yeah, song. I mean honestly. I am... 
honestly, I... how dare you have your own personal tastes? Like, that's just messed up. You shouldn't. On the internet, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I I enjoy the song. Um, sometimes even just to like sing because sometimes, yeah, it's just a nice thing to do. But I definitely can see where it's subjective fault. Um. Yeah, it just. It just it yeah. And with that, we're going to move on to a better song, uh, Amanda's finale with the with the show for the evening, and that is Flow, the main theme of uh, the main theme of Endwalker. One of them. One of them. There's like four, I think. I actually don't have much memory of this one. I hate to say it. Um, this is another you probably one. These... Were... You probably were like. Uh, zoning out because of closing. Are you implying that he went with the flow? Boo! Boo! Even Ginger booed at that. Honestly, fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I... I did that not of a sense of humor, but out of a sense of duty. I know. I know. <laughs> um so yeah I don't really have much to say about this song because I barely remember it uh in fact uh point in case when I put wrote down the set list I hadn't written down whether Amanda was even on the song and I had to go online and look up whether or not she was actually on it um which should tell you just about everything considering how complimentary I've been of both of the featured singers um so, the fact that I don't remember the song that well, or even her on it, should say an awful lot about this one, in and of itself. Um, it's not something that promoted any significant emotion in me, positive or negative. It was fine. Um. See, that's how I feel about Closing the Distance. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, if they did flow together or they did one of the more interesting yes. mixes, I think that would have stuck in my head a lot better. <clears throat> but at this point... I still can't believe flow together doesn't have a more prominent spot, given how much of an impression it left on me. Yeah. Like, I genuinely think the first time you hear it is the single best moment of Endwalker. Oh my, like... The, like, it's like, oh, oh... Oh, um, I will say I personally disagree with that, though it is definitely in my top five of Endwalker. Yes. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's still being stuck in the past and flailing around to impress a dog. Effectively. Whereas mm -hmm. this next song is my personal favorite moment in Endwalker. Aha. Which is and I don't the blame you. primary concert finale, the music for Zodiac himself and Caller. Now, I've been very complimentary of this song from the very beginning. Um, I remember Absolutely. when we first talked about the FF14 soundtrack, or FF14 M Walker soundtrack, you were kind of meh on this one compared to the rest of the franchise. Still, um, whereas me, but I'm I can just see like, why. Yeah. I can see why in a concert, uh, an orchestral concert setting in particular, it can take a whole lot of a dimension. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Especially given the video played. Now, I made it clear that I wasn't going to talk about um, the videos too often because they were largely irrelevant. But I get the impression that the video editors actually understood that End Singer was a mistake because the video shared this song between Zodiac and End Singer. End singer who refuses ah. to have her own boss music now has to crimp it on someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, this performance is out of this world. Now, I've I've always liked this song. I consider this among among the top of the trial themes in the game. 
um, in the entire game. I sh I showed you this arrangement back on like the album version. Yeah. A while ago, and like you were raving about it then, and now. Yeah, getting blasted to the face with a completely different main theme of Endwalker, and then just going into the big just orchestra and choir thing, and I'm just like, this hit me from every angle, and I was like melting in my seat. It was so good. So yeah, um, in fact, I would go so far as to say this might actually be my favorite song on the Endwalker soundtrack as a whole. So yeah, hearing it live, even if it was very expected, is pretty darn good. Um, I don't know what else I can add to this is the worst part. It's just, it's the exact opposite of my opinion on flow. Flow was so just there that I didn't think to remember it. Whereas end caller was so big and huge and amazing that I don't know what I can add. <laughs> um, big the, shout out the, to the, the choir right on this one. I'll say have. this one. Yeah. Big shout out to the choir on this one. Uh, they did an amazing job. Okay, but did they commit to the beat and mid-song rotate the choir 90 degrees? God, <laughs> that would have been... That would have been hilarious, but unfortunately, or fortunately, or unfortunately, or fortunately, um, this, this performance was a little too professional for that sort of shenaniganry. Oh, yes. creation! Bet to my will! <laughs> I was kind of hoping the background video might have done that. That would have been fun. <laughs> Sadly, that didn't. The only shocking swerve it did was including Ensinger in there. Um, <laughs> Honestly, fair. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, the we video for this song shared between Zodiac and Ensinger. And the last shot of the video during the song was Ensinger exploding into Medion. Um, so, yeah, end caller, big over the top. Now, this next one was a surprise for a completely different reason, even if it is kind of expected. The first encore was the Final Fantasy main theme. This one still feels weird to me. Uh, I mentioned this before during, I think it was a Primals concert, where Uematsu himself was on stage doing mixes of his older stuff, that FF14 really feels kind of separate from Final Fantasy as a whole. It feels like its own animal in a lot of ways. Um, so hearing this at a Absolutely. concert for FF14, while, you know, still very much a Final Fantasy song, did, to me, at least feel a little alien. Which... I don't blame you. But it, and yeah, honestly, like... it's like a testament to how unique they've made 14. Yeah. yeah. This is a franchise entry with such a unique identity compared to everything that's come before or since that... Not only that, but if they want to pick a track that reflects the entire license, I feel like even then there are better or less undernose entries. Yeah, I mean, the prelude... I mentioned that usually yeah. is part of From the Heavens. That's that's something that almost would have made more sense, I feel like, is just an everything song. But there's, I don't think, any, like, big over-the-top version of the prelude, at least that I can remember, within the soundtrack. So, what do I know? Um, A New Day did at least play during A Realm Reborn. I remember this. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Uh, well, technically, there's a lot of prelude in... Uh, the Golbez fight, but that's also a remix of another Final Fantasy, so who knows if we'll ever get that. I mean, yeah, but the Golbez fight is a remix of, like, four different songs from FF4, um, which yeah. is awesome. Like, this is not me complaining about it. This is another one of those songs. It's actually, like, a really good remix. But um, in the case of things that up until this point have been entirely FF14 original I I don't know about this one. I I like it. I'm glad it was here, but it feels like it belongs to some other game, which admittedly it kind of does. And that kind of just yeah. of all the things, I just had the realization mm. that I associated with the initial loading screen from Brave Exvius. 
Oh my god, that takes me Maybe back. because on my first uh, on my first time installing it, I left it on so long because it took so much time that it actually melted my phone and had me what? change it. Oh no. Yeah, it actually broke my phone, so Oh, oh my god. Wow. <laughs> So the destroyer of your phone has come to do something, question mark, with the concert. Good to know. Exactly. Something, question mark, is about as far as I can say. Honestly, you know, it gave us some really, like, the video, again, the video was, like, the bigger hopeful moments, the more fun stuff. I think the video went briefly to, like, Gold Saucer. Like, that was the more, like, fun end of the game and not, like, the world-ending terror of the game. Which makes sense, given how hopeful of a song it is. Mm -hmm. Um... Although, just because I'm a massive FF6 fan, there was a part of me that's like, this is going to bust into Setzer's theme at some point, right? <laughs> um, on the subject of Setzer's theme, the Blackjack. Another mount that has bad music in the game that just has generic <laughs> music and really shouldn't. Moving on. That's all I'm going to say about it. Um, and then that brings us to our closing medley, The Final Day. Remember how I said that End Singer showed up on End Caller, which was Zodiac's music? Mm hmm. She doesn't show up here at all. That's hilarious. Yeah. That, so, like, honestly, I was like, no, this is perfect for a, co for a concert because it's basically just their greatest hit medley. Yeah. It's literally just yeah, a medley. It's of, a solid encore song. Yeah. No, it's, it's a perfect encore song and wrap up. And I would make the argument that it works way better as just a plain old medley, which it is than it does as a boss theme for a boss that had nothing to do with half of the music that's in this in this track to begin with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the fact that this song and the video associated with it had more to do with celebrating the prior boss music and the prior expansions instead of playing for the boss this is technically supposed to belong to once again makes me think that someone on the editing team knew that End Singer was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> and getting back to the FF9 remix, Goth Teenager Necron was not something I needed. You ruined a perfectly good bird is what you did. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this was a great way to close out the show. This final second encore. With, um... Again, the medley. I guess my only complaint about it is that in its parts are Ultima, Heroes, The Worm's Tale, and Invincible, three out of four of which they played. Where's The Worm's Tale? I item one, yes, where's The Worm's Tale? That probably should have been included in Stormblood, but also, like, you're kind of repeating yourselves, but also not. Um... Shrug. Shrug. It was still very well performed. I liked it a lot. Um, so yeah, that was the end of this concert that I was able to see. There were other concerts this weekend, and we talked about this a couple of times already. And I'm angry at Square. Yeah, like, I probably would have uh, watched the Primals concert if... Yeah. If that was an option. Right. And Why the can't they do pay-per-view? <laughs> well, it gets even worse than that, because because I had boots on the ground and was actually talking to people who went to the fan fest. apparently this thing was an absolute shit show. Oh. Uh, um, the organization was disgusting. Out of however many tickets sold to the fan fest, you know how many people got into the concert? One thousand. Oh. That's nothing. That's nothing. Like, I'd expect there was at least ten times that on the show. Floor. I think so. What? And that's as many people as they could put in that venue was one thousand. So not only do so the rest of the world not get this, but also... 90% of the people who flew out to Las Vegas to go to FanFest, who got lucky enough to win this lottery to go to FanFest, 90% of them didn't get to see this live either. Huh. That's... 
Uh, it's been pretty clear by this point that I am a major proponent for the preservation of art. These concerts are a rare and special thing, put on basically never. And they've shown before their willingness to make them accessible. Correct. And suddenly it's not there. Why? Yeah. So, I understand the need of having some things be offline. I actually do get that. Yeah. This is not the thing they should have cut. At all. Maybe they had games room that's local, or some kind of Eorzean cafe or something. Something unique to the show floor. Not live performances. Especially not... Yeah, especially, I mean, imagine the hypothetical case of somebody that had to choose between two events or two concerts close by and chose, say, a symphony concert instead of the full busy event with the concert top in it. Yeah. And then can't hear that. Yeah. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. It's insulting. It's so poorly organized, I don't know where to begin. Um, the fact that a lot of the, the flow... Uh, the, the flow? A lot of the show volunteers were contractors. I said nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, who had bad information. Didn't help. Um, and yes. I say the FanFest show... The... the the staff at Virgin was actually very good. Like, I actually have no complaints about Virgin, the theaters at Virgin, AXS, or anybody involved with the organization of Eorzean Symphony. This was a very professionally run concert. I'm very happy with it. My only complaint is that the merch line was maybe too long for its own good. Whatever. Right? Like, that's not the end of the world. That's a, that's a consistent kind of thing. Yeah. I, I got my Elpis flower. I don't care. Nice. Excellent. Um, the fact that these concerts weren't made available... Not even on a pay-per-view basis. You tell me to buy a $50 ticket for these concerts, I will spend $50 to buy a $50 ticket for these concerts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like... And that's kind of how they did it before. Yeah, that's how they did it with and both... And then there was a pandemic and there was like, okay, you get it for, I think, you just get it? Um, as long as you have the virtual ticket or something? The FanFest one, I think, was free. I believe yeah. the other Primals concert was pay-per-view. That, like, special long oh, one. Oh, yes. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. I was willing yeah. to buy tickets for that. Exactly. Why weren't these streamed on some capacity? My only prayer is that they are being recorded and will be released at least on CD. Because apparently, yeah. not only were they not transmitted to the world, but Sam, you mentioned Scream was on there. That's new. That's never been played before. And that's a good one. It's a really good one. Uh, do we know who was on vocals on that? Uh, I don't know. Oh god, if Amanda got her rock on on that song, I'm gonna lose my mind. The fact that I don't know is killing me. The fact that I didn't know that Scream was on there is like, wait, not only are you not the giving this to us, you're not giving it to most of the people who went, and you're debuting new stuff? What is wrong with you? The literal, the only, only, thing the I literal can only reason that I know that it was there was because... Uh, a group called Grinding Gear uh, went to FanFest and got to hear the concert. Um, and they... They're just getting into Endwalker, so they don't know the context of Scream. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so... They, but they were loving it. Now, Rana, you mentioned Final Fantasy yes. Brave Exvius. Yes. I went at one point to the fan festa of Final Fantasy Brave Exvius in, Los, uh, in Long Beach, California, about an hour and a half or so south of Los Angeles. Uh -huh. They also had a couple of concerts there that were orchestral concerts. They just played it on the main show floor. So they just had seats, and if you didn't sit, you were just in standing room, and you could watch the whole show. And yeah, that worked that wonderfully. Sense. And they streamed that, too. So how the hell is a cheap cash grab mobile game, forgive me for being that harsh, but how is a cheap cash grab mobile game more organized and consumer friendly than Final Fantasy XIV's Fan Festa? How did that happen? No idea. 
I don't know, and I really hope they correct things for the London and Tokyo fan fest. They had better. They better. Because this, this is about as angry. This makes me as angry, if not angrier, than the plot twist in Elpis, which almost had me rage quit FF14 entirely. It was so bad. But I am insulted by the organizers here. And now I don't want to blame... I don't want to blame... Yoshi P, and I don't want to blame Koji Fox, and I don't want to blame any of the, like, game producers, because very rarely do they have any let's, real hand in organizing the live events. I don't think they're at fault here. Let's fire things in a proper way. Whoever is responsible for that kind of decision, you suck. You suck! Fair enough? You absolutely suck. <sighs> And I had to get that off my chest, because the preservation of art is so important to me, and the fact that this was so mishandled and not given to the world is a travesty. And I really hope for the later ones they come around and actually will allow a stream, or a recording, or a CD, or something. Let us have this! Don't you want us to give you money? Right? I'm willing. Yeah, I will pay you guys for this. <laughs> I don't have a problem doing that. Shut up and take our money! Thank you, please! You know, I had a similar situation with, um, and I think this is some Japanese banking law, but, um, for a Persona concert, I had another shut up and take my money moment, where I couldn't actually yeah. buy a ticket to a Persona concert that was being live-streamed because I didn't have access to a Japanese payment processor. Ah, yeah. I, I was very I annoyed was by this. I was around for that and saw that. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, wait, why can't I give you my money to listen to this? This is a worldwide streamed concert. What's the problem here? I I feel like this was some kind of Japanese banking law that I think has been corrected since. Hmm. But yeah. In any case. Aerosian Symphony. Aerosian Symphony, great. The other two concerts, probably great. I don't know. I'd love to. We'll find that out when we get the chance. If we're lucky. Moving on. Music Arcade, now playing. So, the main now playing for for today, since y'all had this was supposed to be now playing, uh, the concert that I have, was able to go to for Distant Worlds. Yeah, so which this I was, have been have been bringing up. This was your first Distant Worlds, right? Yes. Congratulations. Uh, they started this off with uh, Phantom Train, uh, from Final Fantasy VI. Next, I don't I, you know, that's kind of a deeper cut, and I appreciate that. Uh, there was a, it felt like there was a lot of deeper cuts on this, honestly. Uh, they did Roses mm. of May from 9. Wonderful. Uh, Ignis and Ravis from, uh, 15. Okay, always good to hear some, uh, Shimamura on there. Uh, Saber's Edge from 13. Good, I like that one live. That one hasn't been on their setlist for a while. It was pretty good. 13 soundtrack is so good. It's underrated. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because the game kind of drags it down, but as much as I dislike 13, I have not a single bad word to say about its soundtrack. My biggest complaint with 13 soundtrack is actually 13 2 soundtrack, and that is why is there a thrash metal chocobo song on here? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, please continue. Uh, a very interesting one for me, honestly, which was Original 7 Cosmo Canyon. They didn't play the remake? No. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. They played the original version of Cosmo Canyon. Uh. Interesting. They Neat. Did they did a bunch of remake songs uh, in the set. They did a few remake songs in the second half. That's so, not surprising. Uh, they Then they brought on Susan uh, for Eyes on Me from <laughs> 8. So, um, I'm going to just assume now at this point that Eyes on Me is just cursed when it comes to performances. Uh, 
Because not only is now Susan Calloway being inflicted upon this song, but the very first time I heard a review of the, or heard a concert version of this song, I forget what concert this was, but they brought in a specific uh, pianist and singer, and you know, this was for a you know professional orchestral concert. You're supposed to dress up nice, and this lady was dressed in some ugly ass orange sweater. That was, like, rebelling against playing, you know, proper decorum. I will say, though, that I liked her performance better for this song than Rag Song. Maybe her vocal range is just more in line with it. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't like her. I've been pretty clear that yeah. it's mostly just the, the sound of her voice bothers uh, me. I don't really... Yeah, and, and then... I mean, one of my... Visions of uh, Susan Calloway is that uh, uh, she feels like she's showboating a little during her performances, and I think yes. Eyes of Me is one of those tracks that kind of fits that. You know what? I would agree with that. I think that one's definitely kind of like an egocentric soloist kind of like. I d not that I'm exactly. calling Susan Calloway an egocentric so uh, yeah, soloist, no, but like it's, it's got that energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, then they ended the, uh, that have the concert with, uh, Aerosian Symphony Triumph. Which was hype. Right. That's a big surprise to show up on. Especially, yeah, because this was the first time that this is shown up on Distant World set list. Yeah. Like, at all. Oh, so that was the debut concert? Uh, they, well, either it was the debut concert or, th like, apparently this was a major, like, reveal. Right on. That's awesome. Uh, then, uh, leading into the second half of the concert was Liberty Fatale. That's a good leadoff. I've heard them play that one a number of times. That's kind of one of their big ones. Straight into Invincible. <laughs> Oh, that's some energy right there. I like that. Uh, which, making the mental joke to myself of like, well, that's to the extreme. Ha. Huh. <laughs> uh, then, uh, Seven Remake, Jesse's theme. Good. I like that one. That's one of the, like, really cool original songs on that one. And then... One of the weirdest, weirdest pieces on the set list, like, that I might have ever heard on a concert set list. The Honey Bee in Dancing Song, Stand Up. Excellent. Wow. Like, they played that at the FF7 Remake concert, but that's the FF7 Remake concert. That's not that weird there. It's a little weird showing up in just regular Distant Worlds. I kind of love that. It was incredible. Everyone was getting hyped. Okay. Uh, followed up immediately by Xanarkand. That's kind of one of their staples. Yeah. Uh, followed up by Dragon Song. Sure. Then they did the Battle Medley. Okay. FF main theme, and then, like, the credits rolled on the screen, on the, like, projector screen, and then, ba da ba da ba da ba da da One-winged angel? One-winged yeah. angel starts playing, and everyone goes ballistic. Yeah, that's usually how it works. I, 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 again, even I will admit that I think it's overplayed at this point, but it does make a great closer, and even I get into it when it's playing alive on stage. It's just not something I want to listen to in my own yeah. time. It's there for a reason. It's there for I... a reason. That was the first time that I've heard it live, so... It's got an energy to it. I've heard that one live it... for, God, 20 years now. Oh my God, has it really been that long? I was expecting, because earlier in the concert... They had mentioned that they were going to be getting 16 arrangements soon. I was putting a 50-50 bet on them putting away from Final Fantasy 16 
as the like post credit scene? Um. Okay. Um. Knowing what I know about distant worlds, no, it's always going to be one winged angel. It'll be one winged angel when we're all old Fair people. Enough. But um. <laughs> but I I would have I, I like when they said soon I was if they made the joke of oh it is soon <laughs> right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, Arnie Roth, um, you haven't been here for a lot of our discussions about him as in a ranger. He's not, he doesn't have that kind of humor. His brother Eric is more inclined to that sort of thing. Um, but mm -hmm. Arnie is way too on the nose. Uh, have you heard Away before? No, no, I'm not familiar at all with FF16 soundtrack. Would you like, I'm gonna throw it in. The answer is actually no, I'd rather hear it when it comes to PC. Right. Um, Say. and I'll wait for patches to happen, so it runs smoothly. Gotcha. Uh, but, yeah, besides that concert, I've mainly been listening to 16 music. Because they, Token and team have done a fantastic job there. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, as for my now playing, I got barely anything, just a new Arknights event. Yay, Arknights. Yeah. I would say I wish I could remember the music, but due to a bug, I'm being drowned by voice lines. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and explain this, because this is not how you sound design for games. Um, so I feel like there's an educational element in, man, this needs patching. So there's a new character uh, called Chong Yue, and he is this brawler guard, this martial artist. And he is voiced in English by Yong Ye, the new voice of Kazuma Kiryu from the Yakuza franchise, so people really like this guy. Um, and he has a thing where after five uses of his skill, he starts attacking twice every attack. He generates, he, he generates skill points per attack. He starts attacking twice per attack string, which means he's gaining double the skill points, and his skill launches off automatically roughly every five seconds. The problem is, as it's currently set, it's programmed to run a voice line every time his skill bar launches off. So, it's going tiny little with Final Fantasy. That's like the the male Vieira voice problem that happened at the beginning of Endwalker. <laughs> <laughs> this guy doesn't shut up, ever. In fact, it's so bad. No, he, he does like full lines. It's so bad that he will interrupt his own voice line with a new voice line. Looks like the anime got the looks like the anime got, got the blue like the... Pretty much. Uh, crazy I, so I don't Love really him. remember the music because Kiryu will not shut up. And that's just where I'm at now. <laughs> One more reason to not like Kiryu, even though this has nothing to do with him except a shared voice actor. Um, so yeah, I don't remember the music for the new Arknights event. Sorry. I hope it's good. Maybe one day I'll get a chance to listen to it. And on my end, not much going on yet. Uh, the main game musical things that I'm interested in right now and looking forward to as uh, it suggests, I'm looking forward to them, but they're not out yet. So we're going to wait for Genshin's next uh, uh, region in order to have what I was hoped for and what they've shown in the trailers, which is a lot of accordion for the Francesque region, <laughs> which is all I could ask for, really. Fair enough. But yeah, no, aside from that, uh, just dabbled a little bit in uh, Baldur's Gate 3 and haven't really found much to write home about yet, but I'm just at the beginning, so that makes sense. Fair enough, yeah. It, if they if they launched off with their biggest stuff early, unless it's a soundtrack as stacked as, like, Curse of Darkness, which does do its best song first, um, it's going to be hard to live up to. So going up to big musical numbers is usually how games work. Yeah, and besides, CRPGs haven't really been at the heart of uh, what the kind of music I vibe with, let's say. Yeah. Hmm. 
So I think that's it for the episode. I think that is it. Thank you all so much for tuning in. As always, you can find a, maybe not a playlist, but you'll find at least the track list in the description below. Um, I'd love to be able to give you guys an actual like concert video, but you know, Square. Mm. Still salty. Um, thank you again, Sam, for joining us on this episode. We appreciate you stepping in. Yep, I'll be back in the floorboards, uh, being the queen of high seek since, uh, 2000, uh, what? Oh, what's that over there? And there she goes! All right, and with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up here. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and we will see you all next episode. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.